Hey listeners welcome to Revolving Time. Time is a fascinating and universal concept that affects every aspect of our life, from the way we measure our days to the way we experience the world around us. On this channel, we'll explore real stories, cheating stories, relationship advice, confessions and more covering everything from the latest research on time perception to the history of calendars and clocks. Join me as we delve into the mysteries of time and uncover the hidden secrets and surprising truths that lie behind this essential part of our existence. Okay let's go on to story. It's about a patient man trying to hold his marriage together when increasingly he seems to be the only one in the marriage. Some lessons you learn by watching others and some you just learn the hard way. This is the story of how I learned my lesson the very hard way. I screwed up in so many ways. I knew this was true the day I got out and my good friend picked me up at the gate. Come on, buddy, the beer is on me. You must be thirsty. If I had just gone to see him that fateful night, if I'd just turned around, walked away, and divorced the bick, these past seven years would have been very different. My name is John Edward Mackenzie. My parents call me Johnny. When I was a teenager, my teachers and coaches started calling me Johnny Mac. When I went to work, it became just Mac. That's where it stands today. Everyone except my parents just call me Mac. There are two things you need to know about me. The first is that I'm a pretty big guy. I'm an even six feet tall and I keep myself in pretty good shape. I have a low energy job, so I visit the gym a few days each week. People meet me and they just assume that I played football in school. I don't like football, football is moronic. Here is the game of football in a nutshell. Line up, snap the ball, run into the guy in front of you. Line up, snap the ball, run into the guy in front of you. Line up. Well, you get the idea. I didn't play it. Here's the second thing you need to know. All my life I was the guy who didn't get mad. I kept my cool no matter what was happening. My wife, on the other hand, had a nasty temper. She didn't discuss, she fought. She'd say anything, do anything, to win the most insignificant disagreement and get her way. She was manipulative, vindictive, and a lying skank, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The only good thing I can say about her is, thank God the divorce was final seven years ago. I met Dolores a few years out of school. Everyone called her Dory, like the boat. I had a good job working in a manufacturing plant that made brushes. I kid you not. We made toothbrushes, clothing brushes, those fist-sized brushes you used to clean pots in the sink, and some really nice wooden-handled brushes that were sold in woodworking supply shops. It wasn't high-tech, but I made good money doing it and my nights and weekends were my own. I was happy. Dory was incredible in the sack. She believed in the third date rule, but I didn't know that until I took her home at the end of our third date. She tried to K-I-L me with sex. I almost dialed 911 to report an assault with a dangerous sigh. I slept very well that night and the next morning she accosted me again. After that, we were a couple. We got together every few days and all weekend long. We went everywhere together and it wasn't long before I popped the question. There's a lesson for you that I learned the hard way and you can learn from my mistake. Don't rush into marriage. It takes a long, long time to really know a person and I didn't take nearly long enough. I married this loving, devoted woman who was eager to give me sex all the time and pretty soon after I said, I do. We didn't. I exaggerate but not a lot. The sex was good for about a year, maybe 18 months, and the marriage was good, too. We got along great. She laughed at my bad jokes and we enjoyed being together. Then, slowly, all the good things started falling off. She was a little less pleased with me. Sex became a bit less frequent, and then downright rare. Every day or two became every week or two if I was lucky and less if she was in a bad mood which was happening more all the time. When we did have sex, it felt more like a mercy F to keep me manageable. As the good things fell off, the bad things piled on. The credit card bills got bigger. She worked later, went out with her girlfriends more, and was tired at night. She wanted dinner delivered where we used to cook together. I knew that reality would settle in eventually, but this was not a reality I relished. All the while I kept my cool. I tried to talk with Dory about our lives, tried to put some spark into our evenings and weekends. I even suggested we go away for a little vacation. I got nowhere. If she didn't like the conversation, it became an argument. If the argument continued, the punishment would start. I knew where this was headed and I tried to make her understand, but she was having none of it. She knew what she wanted and that is the way it would be. What I couldn't understand was why. What happened next should have taught me that keeping it in wasn't going to work. Dory started bringing her girlfriends home from work and inviting them for dinner. These were the nights when she didn't go out with them. Dinner meant I had to buy for five me, my wife, and the three bick because she was too busy visiting with her friends to cook. Whenever I walked into the room, I was asked to go someplace, do this, or get that. It became abundantly clear that I was not welcome. I was sitting in the spare bedroom reading one night when I heard her friend Betty say, My God, he's such a wimp. How can you stand it? 
Dory laughed, are you kidding? He does whatever I say. He'll put up with anything. Damn, I could F you see. K. George right here in the living room and he wouldn't even raise his voice. I couldn't believe my ears. First of all, those B.I.T.C.He's can all go F see themselves. And second, who the hell is George? Look, guys who keep their cool are not guys without emotions and I'm no wimp. Let's make that clear. I feel everything that every hot-headed ass dot hole feels. I just don't want to create more problems that require more fixing. I figure two people who mean well can find the middle ground and solve their problems. But, it was becoming increasingly clear to me that the only middle ground between those bit.chees and me was them kneeling at my feet and begging me not to throw them out bodily. Dory would not be far behind. Maybe I am a wimp. I just sat there and weighed my options. I didn't run in. I didn't confront them all. I didn't kick their collective asses out the door. I didn't push my wife into a chair and yell at her until she shrinks into the cushion. I just sat there and wondered what happened to that wonderful woman I married. I couldn't find her anywhere. It felt like we were headed for the end. Eventually, the bit.ches left. I mean, they all left except for my own personal bit.ch. She poked her head into the room and announced that she was going to bed. When I walked out into the living room I found empty wine glasses and snack bowls that needed to be put in the sink. Yeah, maybe I am a wimp, but I was tired of being disrespected. I'll be patient and think it through, but the situation had to change. Face to face. The next night I sat her down. Dory, we need to talk. I am tired of being disrespected by you and your snarling friends. You ignore me at night. You and your friends talk smack behind my back. I'm your husband, not some whipping boy. This is not going to continue. We need to make some changes or we aren't going to make it. She laughed. Don't be ridiculous. It was just talk. Nobody meant anything by it. Who's George? I asked. That got her. She blanched, but she came back swinging. What do you mean who's George? You mentioned George last night. Who's George? What are you accusing me of? Do you think I'm cheating on you? Are you accusing me of something? I'm asking you, who's George? I am not going to be interrogated. I'm your wife, damn it. And if you think you can accuse me of cheating on you, then you can just sleep in the guest room tonight and every night until you change your tune. Dory steamed off to bed and I heard the bedroom door slam. I sat there thinking about that eruption, and the thought that kept running through my mind was that I asked, who's George? And her reply was, do you think I'm cheating on you? That's not an answer to the question, or is it? I never accused her of cheating. I never mentioned her comment to how she could fool. CK George in the living room and I wouldn't even raise my voice. I only asked pointedly, who's George? Update. Winter came early in our home that year. For the next week there were evenings we didn't even say two words to each other. She shopped sat and she got together with them Sunday. Eventually, the thaw came and I was invited back into our bedroom, but it was far from a honeymoon. The beginning of the end came three months after I overheard the remark about George. The company was sending me to Ohio where they have a plant that was having problems. I had gained something of a reputation for being Mr. Fix-It, and they needed some fixing, so off I went to Ohio. I called Dory every night and she always answered. The calls were brief and I wouldn't say I looked forward to them, but we were functioning at some minimal level. The fix was and I've always wanted to say that and I was headed home. Truth be told, I surprised myself. We got the plant up and running faster than I anticipated and I was headed home early. So, you know what's coming, right? I didn't. If I had, things might have turned out differently. I walked in my front door at about 10 at night. Dory's car was in the driveway. The lights were out. A man's and a woman's clothing were lying on the living room floor, and I heard voices in the bedroom. One listened and I knew what was happening. You can't mistake that sound for anything else. My anger was growing by the second. I picked up the man's pants and I opened his wallet. The driver's license read, George Noble. If ever a man was misnamed, it had to be Mr. Noble. There is never anything noble about Fu. Seeking another man's wife. I don't keep a gun in the house, but I do keep an old-fashioned wooden baseball bat by the door. I have them for home defense and as a nod to my childhood. I grabbed the bat and headed for the bedroom. Walking down the hallway I heard the moaning and grunting. F. I walked quietly down the hallway. As I opened the bedroom door, I saw that Harry S driving his D into my cheating by with her ankles over his shoulders. You need this, don't you babe? Tell me you can't live without this. Swear to me. He can't F you like I do. Yes. I swear. Oh, God, I swear. You need this big C of mine. Don't you? Tell me. Yes. Oh, F yes. Do it for me, George. That's what I need. How can you stand that wimp with his little D? Divorce him, Dory. I'll take care of you. I'll give you what you need. I told you when I started this story that some lessons you learn by watching others and some you learn the hard way. Here is the lesson I learned the hard way that night. When you are filled with rage, you don't have the muscle control that you think you have. 
Okay, that's sarcasm. What I really learned is that revenge isn't worth it. It's best to just walk away and get a divorce. I'd spent my life controlling my temper. When I finally let it out, I paid a hefty price. They didn't know I was there. I walked up behind him and I took a breath. I swung the bat over my head and brought it down hard. I thought I'd knock the wind out of him. At the worst I'd break a rib or two. As God is my witness, I never meant to do more than break a few ribs. I severed his spine just above the waist. Revenge time. You'd think he would have screamed. He just let out a gasp and collapsed onto my wife. Her legs slipped off his shoulders. She had no idea what happened. Then the dory I knew came out, that's it. Give a girl some warning, would you? Don't just quit on me, finish me, damn it. That's when she saw me with the bat in my hands and madness in my eyes. She screamed and shook George, but he didn't respond. George was done. The rest is history. I was arrested, charged with assault, prosecuted, convicted, and given 7 to 15 years. I served 7. There were divorced men and women on the jury with cheating spouses. I swear I almost got off. Final installment of the story. My boss gave me my old job back when I got out. He understood. On my first day back he said to me, Mac, I'm surprised you didn't do it sooner. She was an awful bitch and all her friends were bitches. Welcome back. Now, forget her and get on with your life. I know you're asking, what happened to Dory? Nothing happened to Dory. We divorced and I was glad for it. She took everything that I didn't use to pay my lawyer and left. I was fine with that. I didn't want anything that had been tainted by that bit and where I was going. I didn't need the living room furniture. When I got out, I started over. The only good thing was that she was out of my life and the future looked better than it had for a very long time. Revenge is a fiction. I learned that the hard way. All you ever really get is your freedom and I paid a big price for mine. I lost seven years of my life behind bars and three years before that living with evil incarnate. If only I had turned around, walked away, and just divorced the bit C, I would have been better off. I do think of George from time to time, usually when I'm walking up a flight of stairs and I wonder if he's enjoying his wheels. Tough break, George, but that's what you get for FC another man's wife. When I was writing this, I walked up to a local police officer, told him I was writing this story, and asked what the sentence would be. When he finally finished laughing, he said, 7 to 15, depending on the prosecutor. I said, darn. I was hoping to get him off with less. I left the officer laughing in his patrol car. And the story 1. Okay let's start to the story 2, the cheating bandit. Before start the story 2. I think some of you are tired to lessening for this two story together. Who's tired let's take a cup of coffee. The cheating bandit. This is a little story about betrayal and revenge. Think of it as a mild instance of BTP without the baseball bat to the knees. It's one of those stories that just popped into my head and the only way to remove it was to write it. It begins with a little introspection. Anniversaries come and anniversaries go, but this one was worth celebrating. It was the one year anniversary of the day I discovered that my marriage was over. I know what you're thinking, who celebrates something like that? Well, I'm not so much celebrating the pain as I am pausing to recognize that I lived through it and came out the other side stronger. It was one year ago today that I was sitting in my office thinking, I didn't sign up for this, did I? I remember the vows, dot 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 for better or worse, in sickness and in health till death do we part. Death was starting to look like a way out. It was my exit strategy. You see, that day I learned that my lovely and loving wife of six years, my best friend, the woman who was everything to me, was a cheating. I know what you're thinking. You think the signs were there, she was staying out late, taking showers as soon as she got home, always too tired for sex, and getting snippy with me over every little thing. Nope, there was none of that. I was just a clueless. So how did I find out? It was a Wednesday and nearing the lunch hour. I was on my way back to the office after making an unplanned office visit to a client, and I was thinking that I'd grab a fried fish sandwich at a little shop I know. They call it the whale and it's fresh fried with tartar sauce, lettuce, and tomato on a sub roll. It's like fish and chips on a bun. You know how it is when things are going well. Everything is falling into place, the clients are happy, and you're enjoying thinking about a good lunch that's just minutes ahead of you. That was me. I was fat, dumb, and happy. That's when it happened. I was stopped at a light when I saw my lovely wife coming the other way make a right hand turn into the parking lot of the local no-tell motel. I thought, what the hell? I made a right into the gas station parking lot, pulled into a spot, and watched as she got out of her car and walked straight to one of the rooms. She knocked, the door opened, and in she went like she'd done it a thousand times. What the FC? You're probably thinking that I ran across the street and started beating on the door. Then I broke down the door and beat him with my bare hands. No, now you're thinking that I slipped across the street and walked to the room where I found the curtains slightly parted. I looked between the curtains and I saw everything I need to know. No, not that either. 
I needed to know, but I didn't need for her to know I knew. I just found a place where I could sit quietly in my car and watch that door. An hour after she arrived, she left. Five minutes behind her was a man wearing an expensive suit who got into his Lexus and drove away. Typical, I always thought a Lexus was an overpriced affectation for someone who was showing off. I was useless that afternoon. I didn't even try to work. I just sat in my office and researched divorce on the web. It was as bad as I'd heard. Whether I went with no fault or adultery, the outcome was the same. Damn her. They were going to pay. Then I realized that I didn't even know his name. How was I going to make him pay when I didn't know who he is? That night the fates intervened. I'd hardly said two words to her all night, and she was asking me what was wrong. What the hell did she think was wrong? Was she feeling guilty? Was she afraid I knew something? Or was her thinking so disconnected and her behavior so compartmentalized that she didn't put my attitude and her actions together? I was watching the late night news and there was a local story about a bank being robbed at the lunch hour. They had footage of the robbers and the woman looked passably like my wife. She was wearing a COVID mask, but the hair and eyes along with her height and built made her a good twin for the woman I'd married. Of course, I knew it wasn't her because she was in that motel room laying it down for that shithead with the Lexus, but I can play dumb with the best of them. Hell, maybe I'm not even playing. Update. The next morning I called the police department and asked about the robbery. I was told they were working several leads, which is cop speak for we got nothing. So I ever so innocently told them that the woman looked a lot like the woman who lives down the street from me and I gave them her name. I also told them that she recently bought a new car, which was a half-truth because I bought it and I happened to know that she wasn't at home when the robbery occurred. That last bit was sure as hell true. I figured they'd knock on the front door, have an embarrassing talk with her, and at the least I'd get a good laugh out of it that would carry me through the next few weeks as I filed divorce papers. Oh no, it went much better than that. When the cops saw that she really did resemble the robber to a remarkable degree, and she couldn't explain. Where she was at the time of the robbery, they took her to the station for what they euphemistically referred to as an interview where she was forced to admit to where she'd been and who she'd been with. It wasn't hard for anyone who heard her to guess what she'd been doing. By the way, that's how I eventually got Shithead's name. They kept her while they checked out her alibi. That's a sanitized way of saying they put her in a cell and went to the Shithead's house looking for him. When they didn't find him, his wife gave them his work address. The interest in her husband did not escape the attention of his wife. When he tried to deny the affair, they went to the motel and pulled the records. His electronic signature did not help his credibility with the police, but it did provide them both with an alibi. It turns out that lying to the police really is a crime, and so they returned to his home that evening to charge him with a minor offense. I secretly suspect they waited until he was home so they could arrest him in front of his wife. It didn't result in any great fine or jail time for shithead, but it did get him divorced. The story was just too juicy to contain and the matter of the cheating bandit became a running joke at the station that was soon told to the spouses. The spouses told their friends, and their friends told their friends, and pretty soon my wife and shithead were the laughingstock of the town. Even the judge who heard my divorce plea laughed when he realized who she was. Eventually, the divorce was final. She did all the expected things and said all the usual cliches, but trust was broken, and it wasn't going to mend in this lifetime. She heard the whispers and the stifled laughs behind her back wherever she went, and she soon left town not far behind Shithead. I have no idea where she is or whether they are together, and I can no longer care. I am moving forward. Looking back, I sometimes wonder if it was worth the effort. I knew she cheated on me, and I was content to divorce her for it, but I wanted to hold her up to public ridicule as the cheater who had to confess her affair to avoid being arrested for armed robbery. I imagined her having to admit, sure, I'm a liar and a cheat, but I'm not a thief. There was less satisfaction in it than I had hoped but I have to admit that I would do it again if faced with the same situation. Eventually, two police officers paid me a visit. You can't do anything with anonymity anymore, so they knew full well it was me who called them and tipped them off to my wife. Officially, they were not amused. Unofficially, I offered to buy them each a beer and we decided to call it even. It seems one of them was divorced and the other was getting divorced, and they admired my creativity. Just don't do it again was all they told me. I wasn't sure whether they meant reporting my wife as a bank robber or marrying her in the first place, but either way I agreed to both. Final installment. So here I am a year later. I've rid myself of the deception that plagued me, and I'm rebuilding my life. I had a few minor friends, who were really friends of my wife, that knew about her betrayal, so I had no difficulty cutting them from my life. Then I doubled down on the good friends who stood by me. I didn't date until the divorce was final. I took that time to work through my emotions. Then about a month ago I met a delightful woman my age. She, too, is divorced from a cheat. We have that much in common. She, too, is rebuilding her life. And she, too, 
has made it her life's work to find the very best bourbon made on earth. We consider it our sacred mission, and we take our mission very seriously. Maybe we'll make it and maybe we won't. We're taking it very slow. For now, I'm enjoying every minute I get to spend with her, and tonight she's helping me celebrate my divorce. Wish me luck. End the story too. Thank you for joining us on Revolving Time, where we bring you real-life stories that explore the complexities of the human experience. We hope that our stories have provided you with insights, inspiration, and a renewed appreciation for the power of human resilience. Our storytellers have shared their unique perspectives and experiences, shedding light on issues that are often overlooked or misunderstood. We are honored to have been able to amplify their voices and share their stories with you. We believe that storytelling has the power to create understanding and empathy, and we are committed to continuing to share stories that challenge and expand our understanding of the world. We encourage you to subscribe to our channel and stay connected with our community. By subscribing, you will be the first to know about new stories and events, and you'll have access to a library of inspiring content. Thank you for being a part of our journey, and we look forward to sharing more powerful stories with you in the future.